Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. Hope this transmission finds you all happy and healthy. Thanks for plugging into the matrix that is this show. Hopefully you've got your creativity caps on because our guest this time around is Carl Abrahamson. He's making his third appearance on the show. And much like the previous two, this one is rooted in human artistic expression. Carl was here twice last year talking about his book, O Culture, but he's here this time to rap about a recent documentary he put out called Cinema Magician Conversations with Kenneth Anger, which is about exactly what it sounds like it's about. Carl recorded a couple conversations with highly regarded independent filmmaker Kenneth Anger about his life, his work, and the artistic process that is filmmaking. Good stuff, and you will hear all about it, as well as some tidbits on an upcoming documentary Carl's producing about Anton LaVey, a conference he's putting on at the end of May in the Italian Alps, and a juicy Patreon extension about what Carl calls our human poetry. So if that sounds like your tune, then let's jam. Carl Abrahamson is in the house. Your house. Enjoy. Carl Abrahamson. Man, it is always a pleasure to chat with you. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be back. Absolutely, man. Yeah, we talked a couple of times before about your book that you released last year called O Culture. A couple great chats. I'll link to those in the show notes for people who missed those. Uh, But you're here this time to talk about some different things. You recently released a documentary called Cinemagician, Conversations with Kenneth Anger. And, you know, Kenneth is one of the more well-known underground, independent, experimental filmmakers of the 20th century. I watched the film last night, really enjoyed listening to Kenneth talk about his life and his work and the filmmaking process in general. And before we get into anything else about the documentary, let's tell people a bit about Kenneth Anger, the man, you know, there might be some people who don't know who he is. What was his life like? Where did he come from? What put him on the path to being one of the more influential underground filmmakers? Yeah, well, it's, it's a, his, his story is a very interesting story. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's mainly known for two different things. The filmmaking is one thing. And then there's the Hollywood Babylon books. There are two books. And uh, basically, you know, of course, both uh, aspects deal with film. He grew up in Hollywood. He was born in 1927. So he grew up in, in Hollywood proper at a time when it was really booming. So there were a lot of like real movie stars and real, you know, a real kind of glamour based around that. So that led to him starting, you know, to collect movie memorabilia and hearing stories. He went to Beverly Hills High School. So he hung out with, you know, movie star kids. So that's, that's one aspect that later on in his life came to fruition through writing these pretty sardonic tales or articles about movie stars and the sort of the dark side of, um, <laughs> of the so-called glamorous life. It wasn't all glamorous and it still isn't. So he specialized in that because of his, simply his, his memories and his memorabilia. And uh, he talks about that in my film, that it was actually when he was in France in the uh, 50s, that François Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, they were, uh, they had this magazine called Cahiers de Cinéma, and they encouraged Anger, who was living in France at that time, to write these stories. And they were later on, you know, collected in book form and first came out in French and then in, in English and became these sort of massive bestsellers, the Hollywood Babylon books. So that's one aspect why, why he's interesting. And the other one is his own filmmaking. He started out making experimental very personal, beautiful, visionary films already in the late 40s when he was around 20. And he kept on going and he has kept on going. But the, the most well-known films are, were made sort of between the 50s and the 1980s. And it's usually um, under the umbrella of something he calls the magic lantern cycle. And they're all films dealing with magic, mythology. Uh, Crowley and Thelema uh, are two very important cornerstones of his cinematic creations and i was very happy about that in 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 my documentary that he was willing to talk about uh, crowley because that's not really that uh, frequent you know he uses crowley uh, symbolically and uh, you know actually in his films but he hasn't been too open talking about it so but now that's on record so to speak and i'm very very happy about that absolutely yeah and we'll dig more into some of those details that you threw out in a bit 
But I'm curious, when did you first discover his work, whether it was the books or the films? It was definitely um, the films. When I was like a, you know, a teenager, there was a time when um, you know, VHS had just about you know, became like a household format for, for watching films outside of the cinema or the cinematheque or you know, these kind of highbrow places where they showed these kinds of films. And I grew up in, in a tiny place, <laughs> tinier than most big cities, which is Stockholm. And there was a cinematheque there, and I, I went there already as a teenager. And I could see these programs of American experimental cinema. And uh, at the same time, you know, parallel to that, I was also interested in Crowley and in magic. And here was this guy who had sort of joined these forces and made movie magic. I mean, literal movie magic with his films. And that blew me away. So when I was like a young academic and not really knowing where I was headed, I, I studied film history and film theory. And I wrote about Alistair Crowley's influence in Kenneth Anger's films already in 1989 at Stockholm University. And that led to my meeting Anger. And we had some you know, friends in common. And it was just like strange twists of destiny that led me to going to Hollywood in 1989. And that's when I met him the first time. And we got on and I did interviews. And then over the decades, I've just kept going in a way. And then at a certain point, was just, this just needs to be documented on video. You know, just have to make it available for other people more than just a textual interview here or a textual interview there. I, I felt a strong need or, you know, compulsion to make a film about anger. And so, but that was the first time I met him in, in 1989. And it's remarkable how time flies. And, and I feel that this, <laughs> you know, that I finished this documentary sort of, that's a full circle movement. It took like, you know, 30 years, but it was worth it. You mentioned Crowley as one of his influences you know, obviously from a magical or a spiritual perspective, but from what you can tell, what were some of his influences either in that realm as well, or also on the artistic and creative side of filmmaking itself? Do you see any other filmmakers that, you know, he might have grown up watching that had their work influenced his films? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, and he talks a bit about that in the film also, I would say, you know, Sean Cocteau, who had made so many, you know, beautiful poetic films that are, you know, narrative or, you know, more or less narrative, but they're very, very poetic, very beautifully shot. And it's just this ethereal kind of poetic beauty that uh, Anger tried to incorporate in, in his own films and succeeded very well. So I would say that Jean Cocteau is, is, uh, and many of the other like French directors of, of an early era, Bresson, and he talks about, you know, the surrealist filmmakers like, you know, Louis Bunuel. So it's kind of a European flair to it in terms of the movie making. And then the fact that he wove in a lot of, of Crowley and sort of mythological material, that's more on a content level, whereas the film form, the, the visual acumen, sort of, it, it's very linked to, I would say, the, like a European avant-garde. Yeah, and so for people who don't know some of these films, you know, how would you go about beginning to describe his body of work on film? I mean, would you call it occult? Would you call it magical? Would you call it, I guess you said mythological too? I would definitely call it magical, meaning each of his films has a purpose. The film is made and it's designed to cause change to occur in conformity with will, to paraphrase uh, Crowley. And that was there already from the beginning his first official film fireworks uh, which is just like a, a very short again poetic dreamlike film he references when talking about the film uh, like a self-initiation ritual written by crowley called liber pyramidos and then it just goes on and on in inauguration of the pleasure dome there are people partaking in a, a ritual and they're taking on these different god forms and crowley is vi vi their visual uh, like in uh, images of Crowley exist in the film proper. And then, of course, there's the Anger's most famous film, Lucifer Rising. It's all about the awakening of Horus and the, the Aeon of Thelema, Aeon of Horus. So all of these things are more or less blatant. They're more or less manifested in content. But if we look at them as just great American experimental films, they are always more than that because we don't have to know what anger had in mind we don't know what the specific magical purpose is you could say with lucifer rising that yeah you know anger wants to help usher in the aeon of horus 
by showing exactly that. Uh, so that's kind of a, a blatant thing. But in other films, like uh, Scorpio Rising, which is about you know youth in New York who who fidget about with their motorcycles and go motorcycle racing and have par- strange parties to rock and roll music, there's nothing apparent. There's nothing obvious that tells people that this film is a ritual to again usher in the Aeon of Horus. But there are so many references in the film. And of course, when, when Anger talks about the film or writes about the film, that it makes sense. You know, the entire body of work is a bag filled with magical talismans. Each little film has a specific purpose. And whether the audience gets that or not, it, that's besides the point for Anger. But I think that's one of the reasons why his films are so strong. You know, they, they work on um, uh, subconscious levels and you get sort of like a, a jolt. You don't know what hit you in a way because you have this sort of beautiful appearance on the screen or on, on the video screen or whatever, wherever you're watching it. And it's just a powerful experience, much more so than other like experimental films from the time, which were more you know formal. They dealt with form and taking on new cinematic forms. But there's always a strong sense of content in anger. And the content is, you know, it, it's magical. Well, yeah, and you did say that at the beginning of the documentary that his films are made to have a magical effect. And I was curious, Mm -hmm. like, I mean, you've been talking about it here somewhat, but was it just meant to affect him while he was doing it? Or was it really meant to change something in the viewer's, you know, psychological makeup? Well, I hear I can only speculate because (laughs) I haven't been able to peek into his mind fully. I think it's, it's a mix of both. You know, you have an artist who wants to express himself on his own terms. And what does the artist want to express? Sometimes that may not be super rational and clear, but it could be more like via an intuitive artistic process. But, you know, if you look at these things, there's always, there's always some kind of reference to, to Crowley and to Thelema. And I don't know. So you could say that they're a bit like agitation. You know, anger wants to sow seed of Crowley, sow seed of Thelema in the people who are watching his films. But whether that, whether that goes like beyond that in Anger's mind, I don't know. So in terms of him as being the filmmaker or creator of these films, I think, of course, he made these films to have an impact, for instance, to uh, make people more aware of his existence and, you know, give, giving him more funding for films or giving him more screening. So whatever it could have been, but that that's just inherent in any artistic process of any artist. Basically, you just want more exposure more acknowledgement so i think that he's also done a great job in that sense if you look at that as a the films as being magical talismans because he has had a long career yet he's made you know not so many films there are quite few films if you if you um, look at it you know the time span but at the same time it's not a matter of quantity it's, it's definitely a matter of quality but what i mean is that he's well lauded he's well acknowledged he's well celebrated and he you know uh, i don't know about now but he used to up until fairly recently you know host evenings or or uh, lecture at colleges and things like that and i think his writing of hollywood babylon sort of helped that along uh, it's made him more of a cult figure in general because people love those juicy gossipy stories that are in his books so i think it's it's kind of a combo yeah, and since you brought that back up, tell people a little bit more about these Hollywood Babylon books. They're pretty controversial when they came out because of the sort of, you know, sardonic, gossipy nature of them. But from what we can tell, like, he was just writing mostly true stories about the people he was interacting with in Hollywood, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the true is uh, it's a very vague kind of thing. You could argue that, that <laughs> yeah. uh, when something is slightly larger than life, there's this great expression when you call something a truth and a half. You know, it's it's not only what's being said, but it's how it's said. And, and you, you can spice things up a little bit. That doesn't make the actual event become untrue, but it maybe it creates a bit of a taint. And that taint is usually more entertaining when it's a bit, you know, sardonic or cynical. So the tone of his books, I think, uh, to a great extent, came from, you know, writers like uh, Luella Parsons, who was this movie... I don't know, movie critic is maybe <laughs> too strong a word. But she, she was very gossipy, like a gossip uh, gossip columnist and wrote about the movie stars and always insinuating that someone was, you know, gay or not correct or 
or had these you know drug problems <laughs> so people sort of got it between the lines but it just added to the the stories that were already spellbinding because these people were so astronomically successful astronomically rich and of course people love when these kinds of demigods have problems because that makes them more relatable in a way so i think anger carried on in a tradition that he actually grew up with meaning that kind of uh, gossip column and slash film criticism. And again, as he says in, in my film too, that all of the stories had been checked by you know, at least two lawyers so that there was nothing that could be the father of a lawsuit or some kind of litigation. And it's just a very a, a dark take on, on Hollywood glamour. And I can really r- strongly recommend those books because they're highly, highly entertaining. And of course, it works on a level where you could take it at like a face value. This is someone who who's obviously knowledgeable and he's writing about these movie stars. So that's one aspect. But if you also, as a reader, really love old Hollywood and find it, you know, actually a kind of a Mount Olympus with, with demigods, then it takes on a different level of engagement because you know these people, you've seen movies with these actors. And then to find that they, wow, they also had really human aspects or human sides, flaws and, and faults and, and uh, neuroses and criminal records and, and all these things. And it becomes just, again, it's like a truth and a half. And, you know, speaking of, I guess, juicy Hollywood stories, there's some interesting stories around sort of like the pre-production and the filming of Lucifer Rising that I, I'm sure you're aware of. I know one has to do with Jimmy Page and going to the Bolskin house at Loch Ness. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know this story? I don't know exactly which story. There are many stories from, from, from this era, but, you know, let, let's hear it. Okay. The only story that I know about that I was referring to was that, I guess, at Jimmy Page's invitation that Anger went to the Bolskin house while he owned it in Scotland and helped Page sort of like, I guess, exercise a ghost from it or a spirit or a demon or something. I'm not sure what that Mm -hmm. is. And then because anger helped him do that, that page agreed to produce the soundtrack for the, the Lucifer rising film. Is that true? I I wouldn't know if that's true, but what happened was that in the um, sort of after the debacle in which uh, Bobby Beausoleil had stolen the existing footage of the first version of Lucifer rising, and and just snatched all the film cans that he could find. That film was already, you know, having been been in production for for uh, quite some time. That was when Anger was living in San Francisco. So that was a devastating blow. And Anger actually posted an ad in the Village Voice, you know, like a, a necrologue saying, you know, Kenneth Anger and his the dates of his birth and stuff like that, and the dates of his death, meaning that year, as a filmmaker. So, but he was encouraged after that to get going again. And he, at this time, he had fairly, you know, influential and cool films who really loved his stuff. You know, they loved Scorpio Rising, for instance, and and Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome, who during the druggy 60s had been, especially Inauguration, like the ultimate trip films. They were shown, people were tripping, and then Scorpio Rising was a bit more harsh, but it was quite a successful film for a low-budget, independent, experimental film. So Anger knew the Rolling Stones, Anger knew Jimmy Page because they were both collectors of Crowleyana. And so what happened was that Anger relocated to the UK, I think in the shift in the very, very early uh, 1970s. And I don't know about this sort of exorcism that you mentioned. That sounds certainly that it could have happened, but it could also be like a mythic little thing. But Anger actually stayed at Jimmy Page's house, I think in London, and had set up an, a little editing studio and was editing the new version of uh, Lucifer Rising that had been shot during the first parts of, of the 70s. And at this time, it was very convenient because um, Anger was actually working in Jimmy Page's house that they you know, worked on, on the soundtrack. But as often happened throughout you know, Anger's life and career, there is a falling out. And there was a falling out between Anger and Jimmy Page that led to Page sort of scrapping the soundtrack. And it's a shame. It's a great, great, great soundtrack. H- have you heard it? No, no, I have not heard it. No, it's fantastic. And it, it's for a version of Lucifer Rising that's slightly shorter. You know, it's like a work in progress kind of thing. 
and it's very uh, Eastern in a way. Uh, Jimmy Page, this tablas, you know, and I guess Jimmy Page plays, uh, of course, electric guitar, but it's also kind of like a sitar sound. So it's very, very psychedelic, very evocative. I, I love that piece of music. So it's, it's a shame. But what happened then was, of course, another interesting story is that uh, Anger sort of became friendly again with Bobby Beausoleil, who at this time you know, was, was uh, incarcerated and still is. You know, he's in prison for life for, for murdering that, what's his name, Gary Hinman, in the Manson debacle in the late 60s. So that led to Bobby Beausoleil recording like a new soundtrack. And that's the soundtrack that's the official soundtrack today to the version that's the official one. I mean, so there are remarkable stories for each production, both, you know, concerning the music. Anger has always had, you know, amazing taste in music and uh, his use of contemporary pop songs in uh, Scorpio Rising, for instance, was an, you know, active, active uh, influence and inspiration for someone like Martin Scorsese for in, use, using that kind of contrapunctual use of pop music. You know, when something is going on that's very, you know, grim or someone is beating up and you have a pop song saying that life is great, you know, that creates a contrapunctual kind of clash in people's uh, minds. And Anger was the first one to really work with that kind of thing in Scorpio Rising. So his use of music has always been, his choice of music has always been very, very smart ahead of its time. You also said earlier that you mentioned the phrase, the magic lantern cycle, and, and this mm-hmm. is a, a phrase that, that he uses to describe, I don't think it's all of his films, but I think it's just a certain group of them. Yeah, up, right? up, up, and including Lucifer Rising, I'd say. I'm not sure whether he's uh, included the, the following ones. Maybe the, I don't know, I would say that maybe a film like The Man We'd Like to Hang, which is like a film about Crowley's paintings, that could be... Uh, seen as fit, you know, belonging to the Magic Lantern cycle. But I, I can't tell. That's for, for anger to define. Well, I was just going to ask, like, do you know what films he considers part of that and what they may have in common with each other, I guess? Well, definitely, definitely everything up until and including uh, Lucifer Rising. And then there, there have been some, you know, uh, such long periods of discernible silence in a way, you know, where nothing has come out. But there's, there's some beautiful films like, you know, Mouse Heaven with these toys. And Ishvil, which is a rendering of uh, these old like Hitler Jugend films, and there's um, the man we'd like to hang, which is basically like an assemblage of Crowley's paintings. So I, I wouldn't know. I would say that the Crowley painting films could definitely belong under the same umbrella as something like Lucifer Rising, for instance. But I'm not sure. That would be for for anger to to uh, define. Yeah, 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 for sure. So. You know, I like something that he said in the first conversation. There's two conversations in the film mm-hmm. that you've documented here. And in the first one, he said that he never thought about the audience when making films because the films themselves were personal statements. And yeah. I like that because, you know, that's what art is supposed to be. And I don't think we have nearly enough personal statements out there in the world right now. Mm. I'm not saying everyone has to bear their soul in a piece of art. But I think we'd have much more interesting art if they did, don't you think? I think so. But then again, you know, if if an uninteresting person flaunts everything, you can respect the integrity, but uh, that's not saying that it automatically becomes interesting. I think uh, as an attitude, it's commendable, and, and that's something that should be encouraged, for instance, at art schools. But it seems that the opposite is true. They, they uh, just want to make artists little producers of commodified art that can be sold and with a you know, like this programmatic approach where everything needs to be explained in semi political statements and stuff like that so uh, i think what makes anger unique and the reason why we and you know so many people love anger is that he's a visionary artist you know he goes beyond the rational he goes into uncharted domains of the subconscious and the un- unconscious and the mythological that's his main appeal, that he sort of aestheticized his inner thoughts, his inner visions, and he managed to pull it off because he's a great filmmaker. And um, he has, uh, you know, interesting things to recount or, or, or tell through his visionary expressions. But the, that attitude of being, you know, uncompromising, that could also lead to absolute duds. But that has to do with whether the artist is interesting to you or not. 
But I do agree that that attitude is uh, something that artists should have. They should not be, you know, compliant. They should not be politically correct. They should not be subservient to some kind of, you know, art world system of, of commercial considerations. Yeah, and he definitely fits in that sort of mold for sure. But yeah. was he ever tempted to be more commercial? Was he ever courted by the Hollywood studio system as far as you know? I don't think so. I think he's always had this attitude. And I mean, he mentioned that, mentions that briefly in the film also that, you know, he's very happy or, or proud of his uh, achievement of having retained this attitude throughout life. But at the same time, it also shines through pretty clearly that he's always had a problem finding funding, finding the means to make his films exactly as he wanted them. So that's a dilemma in terms of the uncompromising attitude. Because there are many great, great, great filmmakers who have compromised, for instance, in their private life. You know, they could, could have made something commercial or had another job, whatever, you know, anything to get the money together to make an uncompromising film. And many of them have succeeded. So that, uh, you know, shines a light on the dilemma itself. To, to what extent is it good to be, well, like the proverbial starving artist? Is that really the most conducive way? in order to achieve what you want to achieve. I mean, I can't give a general answer to that. Each artist has to, to answer that for him or herself. But I do think that anger has been so determined and so focused in a way on maintaining his attitude that maybe it has been detrimental for his overall work. I could sense that there was some kind of sentiment in there that, um, you know, maybe if I had worked a little bit in Hollywood, then I could have had the money to make my own films without any problems, without any sort of hassles. But what's done is done, and his achievements are fantastic. I mean, to have made so many beautiful, powerful films with such small means, that's a remarkable feat. And one of the reasons why, why, uh, why I love him and you know, why I find him so inspiring and if you remember, I, I asked him sort of midpoint in the film, what kind of advice would you give to a young filmmaker who wants to, you know, to keep this uh, attitude of, of uh, integrity? And he gives such a beautiful answer. He says, to have rich parents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, that really, really cracked me up, you know, because that, of course, is, is uh, not for everyone. Not, you can't pick your parents. But what I think he, he uh, very humorously points out is that, you know, even if things are cheaper these days, technological developments have made, you know, making films actually, it's possible, you know, it's possible to do it. But still, you need money, you need some kind of money. And that's something that he returns to uh, many times in, in these interviews. So you have to find some kind of balance, you know, if you don't have rich parents, then you might, you know, have to get a job and, and, and save up on stuff or work in the industry and find cheap labor there or if your vision is strong enough, then, then it'll work out. It'll work out. Another hero of mine, Werner Herzog, he actually you know, stole a film camera in the, in the 60s from the film school that he didn't attend. <laughs> he just, he just <laughs> you know, stole a camera. And that, that's a camera that he used for, I think, the first seven feature films of his career. So, so there are different, <laughs> different ways to go, go about it if you're determined enough to make your films. And Anger certainly has been with very small means. He's been, been able to make uh, some pretty magical stuff. Absolutely. And that's why I enjoyed the documentary so much was because you captured the essence of his personality so well. I could never tell if he was being serious or sarcastic, and I enjoyed every minute of it, though. I didn't really care, you know? I was just like, this is an artist, so yeah, I have to absolutely. expect that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy, happy that you that you liked it because the thing is that I have been with him during different circumstances, and some of them have been uh, like in in front of audiences, like we've been sitting in conversation at film schools and events and stuff like that. And on a good night, he can be incredibly entertaining because he has such a, a vast amount of these like Hollywood stories, for instance, and his life has been so fascinating, you know, beyond belief. And that, again, you know, has to do with that kind of attitude. So it's certainly inspiring. But at the same time, there's always this, um, I wouldn't say bitterness, but, you know, this doubt uh, where he said, had I gone down a different route, maybe I could have done things differently. But, you know, what, what's done is done. And so that said, sometimes he can be a little bit 
uh, moping in a way. And, and I know several journalists who've only met him like once, they've had a hard time getting the goodies out of him because he's been, you know, in the bad mood or just not interested. Yeah. Well, I mean, that comes with age too, I think, you know, I mean, yeah. he's 92 now, I think. So that's, yeah. he's had a long life, long career for sure. And mm -hmm. I was curious though, like, you know, you're a filmmaker, you're an artist. Yep. How would you say that his work has inspired you? I think in, in very many ways. I mean, it's hard to pick out which one might be the most important or the most influential. I discovered him at a time when I was like a, a sponge in a way, you know, taking in so much information and stuff. I loved uh, what's called the new American cinema, which means like certain filmmakers had kind of a very experimental approach, both in terms of feature films and uh, artistic films and documentary films. It was kind of a formal upheaval, for instance, in, in the 60s, but also in the 50s that I really liked. And, and when I started studying film and I went to film school, that attitude of making do with what you had in a way, of course, you, should, you wanted to expand things and, and try to get this or that to make your film stronger or better. But you could also, like Anger talks about Georges Méliès, you know, this original French filmmaker from the turn of the previous century, who made these incredibly, you know, funny and daring films that had, again, they relied on fantasy, they relied on props, they relied on people helping out and making these bizarre films that no one at that time had seen before, like the trip to the moon and things like that, using uh, animation and basically using what you had access to, to the max. And that inspired me. And that has always inspired me in terms of anger. So you can shoot good material and you edit it in a powerful way. And then you add some good music that should make for a good film. And I certainly apply that in my more, you know, artistic films. I don't know so much about the documentaries, but I think many of the directors that have inspired me, except for anger, they sort of stem from the same soil, that sort of 1940s, 1950s, 1960s formal upheaval, whether it's in narrative film or whether it's in documentaries. In part, that also had to do with technological developments. You didn't have to have like chunky, incredibly big 35 millimeter cameras and, and complicated sound stages. You could do things with a handheld 60 millimeter camera. That was kind of, it's a strange word I know, but democratization that led to, you know, families could buy their own film cameras and the kids could use them. And that led to a revolution to, to a similar kind of extent that has happened today with, with digital. You know, when, when video cameras that are incredibly good and totally okay for shooting like a, a feature film is no more than maybe a thousand dollars. You know, it's incredible. So that kind of, you know, the technology has in a way led or paved the way for creative people. But that in itself doesn't create great filmmakers. The filmmakers, they are driven by visions and by ideas and concepts that are, you know, destined to become films. And they will become films sooner or later because it's just, that's just the way it is. But if you have put the technology into the hands of, of that kind of person, then you'll have great films. I'm not quite sure that I'm there yet, but I'm certainly striving for it actively by making, making a lot of films. And anger, I think, will always be with me as a kind of a patron saint, perhaps not always in terms of aesthetics, but certainly in terms of attitude. Yeah, and you mentioned A Trip to the Moon and that, that answer. And I just watched that for the first time maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. And where the hell have I been, first of all? I mean, <laughs> that's a fantastic film. And it's just, yeah. it's not something that you would think... You know, like, I just don't know why I would have sought that out in my youth, I guess. But I wish I would have, because I probably would have watched it very differently, you know, mm -hmm. back then versus now. But I think it's probably the first science fiction story on film. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I can, I would love to have been like a fly, fly on the wall, like the first screening of that film in a, in a, in a cinema, how people reacted. You know, when they saw these weird things. Yeah. Because it's like these, you know, remember these uh, people who are dressed up as skeletons and, and it's just so, amazing again with small means he created different worlds literally and and of course the film medium was young and strong and it really affected people so so yeah so you know make use of whatever you have and use it to the max that's the philosophy 
Yeah, and I remember after I watched it, I looked it up online to read more about it, and 100% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, if I remember correctly, which just blew my (laughs) mind. So, (laughs) anyways, so of all the conversation documented in the film itself, what was your favorite part, or what was your major takeaway from these chats that you share with the audience here? I think that it's hard, because uh, there was also a lot of stuff that was, you know, cut away. It's hard when you put these things together to find like a red thread. Like I mentioned also, I could have maybe made like a biopic, made it more advanced or or lavish in a way. But this is also, let's remember, a low budget film and I haven't had funds to uh, turn it into something lavish. But again, with that same attitude, I may do with what I had. So in terms of actual, you know, moments or conversations, I think I was very, I'm very happy with the fact that anger comes across as someone who's, you know, not only interesting, but actually can be, you know, quite jovial and, and, uh, interested in talking. When you're a first time interview with him, he can come across as a little bit harsh. Of course, there can be, you know, good days too, but he's usually quite, you know, reticent and, and, uh, seems almost a little bit unwilling to talk about himself and his work and stuff like that. So, I'm happy that I got so much good stuff. It has to do with the fact that I've met him throughout the decades and done similar things, meaning interviewed him many times. That's why I wanted to to do this stuff on video too, because it has more impact. And in a way, it's his medium too. And I had already started producing documentary films, I think in 2013. So I was already on a roll and, you know, Anger was, he is such a hero for me. So to have done it, that, that's basically the, the main thing that I took away from all these things. I'm very happy that it's done. And for me personally, as I said before, it's, it's a strong full circle moment because uh, in 1989, I wrote my dissertation at Stockholm University about Crowley in Anger's work. So that doesn't mean that I will now sort of <laughs> you know, leave Anger or leave my interest. But it's an interesting thing to look back at your own life and how long it takes sometimes to tie up these uh, knots, to tie up the sack, the bag, and create this full circle moment. And I think that maybe it has to do with my, my own age or my own trajectory, where I'm headed, that I need to do these things. I need to, in a way... Uh, say goodbye to interests that have uh, had their origins in my own youth in a way i'm i'm uh, headed in uh, you know not necessarily a different direction but i'm headed in a direction that's more uniquely my own i think and what i mean by that is like making a feature film based on your own script that's headed in your own way if you're making documentaries all your life about other people then you're sort of enmeshed in them and their work And that's fair and fine. And I will always do that too. I can't not do that. But in order to be a, like a full fledged filmmaker, I think you have to not only have, you know, technical storytelling aspects, you have to have your own vision as well. And that's what I'm working on right now. Well, I agree with that 100%. And I'm glad to hear that. And, you know, speaking of full circle too, you know, Anger made a film in 1969 called Invocation of My Demon Brother. Mm -hmm. which it's very short, so it's maybe like 10 or 12 minutes, but it it did Mm. feature Anton LaVey had a a role in that. And Mm -hmm. he's actually the subject of your next documentary, as far as I know. (laughs) Yeah, 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 that's (laughs) Uh, true. So it's a good little connection there between Anger's work and then what you're working on. You've met both those guys, too, obviously. We talked about Anton the last couple times we chatted. You did recently crowdfund for the, I guess, the post-production, right, of Mm -hmm. this documentary, and it's called Into the Devil's Den, forthcoming. What is the inspiration for that film, then? Is it in the same vein as you just said, like trying to move on from some things from your youth, or is it different? I haven't thought about this specific film in that way, but I guess it is on some kind of, you know, unconscious or subconscious level. And again, it's not a matter of... uh, you know, saying bye-bye to the interests of my youth. But I think it's a way of giving back also because of the immense amounts of inspiration that I've drawn from, from LaVey, for instance. And the funny thing is that when I started to think about it and, and my own relationship and, you know, what the hell happened and how did this happen and what has that meant for me, 
then of course I've retained, I've, I've stayed in touch and, you know, stayed in friendly relationships with many of the people that I met at that time. Again, late eighties, early nineties. And it's funny when I, we started talking about it is that many of us shared the same schematic experiences, meaning, you know, at this time, LaVey was uh, very uh, reclusive in a way. He only saw like select people and they all had a good time, but he wasn't like the extroverted person of the 60s, courting men's magazines and courting television and being that visible devil guy. So what happened was that the Black House became like a, a center in which he, you know, he attracted people that he liked or that he saw had you know, potential in some way. And then the way I express it, so little seed in them to see where, you know, wherever that went. And unfortunately, he, he didn't live to see it. But I can see many people who've become either, you know, actively working with the philosophy inside the Church of Satan or uh, also outside of it with people who are, you know, artists. And, and they all share a, a more or less similar story in the, you know, the way LaVey treated them and the way they, you know, fed back and how a friendship evolved and the nights in the, um, in the kitchen where the synths were and the music making and, you know, and the dinners. It was all, you know, remarkable how many people had the same kinds of memories, the same kinds of stories. So I wanted to make a film based on these people's memories to show that LaVey wasn't just, uh, he was not a, a, a bitter kind of cynical recluse. And he was not a showman of the 1960s. He was somewhere in between. And he was very, very concerned actively with things like legacy. He wanted to leave the Church of Satan in good hands. He wanted to have people involved, you know, more or less involved, that could take his own interests on after his demise. And and I hope that he's happy with, you know, with, with his legacy because it's very, very alive. And I don't have any like, you know, propagandistic purposes with the film. It's not about selling his philosophy. It's not about selling, you know, the Church of Satan per se. But that organization and his philosophy have been very important for me personally. So I want to show it in light that's neither, you know, scandalous or, or, or sensational in any way. And I don't want to be too, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, staring into the belly button of, of the beast either. You know, I want to tell a great story about a man who was so incredibly talented uh, musically and who came up with all these ideas and concocted his own, you know, magical syntheses. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Now, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that no one has made a documentary, like a serious documentary about him before. But uh, I hope to to beat <laughs> anyone else to it. And And the film is going to, I'm actually actively working with it now, and it's going to premiere at uh, Halloween. Well, what a uh, appropriate time for it to yeah. appear, for sure. So, you know, and it, Anton is certainly a fascinating person, and he has been written about quite a bit. I didn't really know that there wasn't another documentary of sorts well, there out are there. Two, there. There are two, are, are there? or actually uh, three, three that I know of. This Satanis from 1969, uh, which is a great uh, sort of independent documentary uh, with great ambitions, and it's very interesting, has, uh, you know, ritual footage and interviews. And then there's uh, Nick Bogas uh, and Adam Parfrey's Speak of the Devil from 1993, uh, which is great too. And that shows, uh, that's like a creation from LaVey's own mind in a way. And it's great fun. And then parallel to mine, there's another one being made, I think, by a Spanish or Portuguese producer. But of course, that's not ready yet. So I have no idea how that's going to be. But what we can see is that there's definitely like an upsurge of interest. And I also want to counter. I want to counter that kind of bullshit that happens when American horror story try to, you know, portray something satanic with someone who is, you know, obviously uh, like a Lavean clone. And it's all the similar kind of bullshit that existed like in the 50s in horror movies. It's horrible. I haven't watched it. And I never will. But I heard that it's, that it's appalling. And I want to, you know, I really want to change that public persona to... Uh, give people my memories and it's not only my memories it's memories of of many people who had the for good fortune to to hang out with him under casual circumstances and there are some familiar names uh, in the film from what i've seen tell people a little bit about who you've been able to talk to so far 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Anger is in the film and he has, uh, you know, they were good friends up until the very end. And Anger actually lived in the Black House uh, from, from time to time. Uh, so that's actually, you know, um, touching, moving material when, when uh, Anger talks about his memories and missing LaVe and stuff like that. It's almost like a tearjerker. And then Blanche Barton, who was, of course, um, LaVe's partner and, and, you know, collaborator with the church. And there's uh, Peter Gilmore and Peggy Nadremia, who are, are responsible for the Church of Satan now. And Mitch Horowitz, who is, uh, who doesn't come from that uh, satanic uh, origins and didn't, didn't hang out with LaVey, but who is a great, great, great scholar, you know, like a scholar of, of uh, occultism, is a great editor and makes fantastic books. So he talks about LaVey in a kind of a, from the perspective of, of uh, religious science in a way, a religious history. And then there's Michael Moynihan and uh, several other people. Unfortunately, uh, I hadn't started the film yet when, when uh, Adam Parfrey died, uh, which was way, way, way too soon. But Parfrey was uh, instrumental in sort of repackaging LaVey for a new generation in a way. Uh, that would have been interesting to, to talk to him about his experiences. But there's, there's going to be some more people also. And uh, the only thing I know is that I've made up my mind and I've set the date. It's going to premiere on Halloween. And the stuff I have so far in terms of our archival material and new interviews, it's uh, it's going to be a really, really good one. It's exciting because this is this is by far the most ambitious documentary film that I've done so far. Uh, I'm used to like sitting in a in a one on one situation with one artist and talking about you know life and career, but this will be more more like a a biopic without actually being a biopic. It'll be based on people's memories and and the fondness of uh, of the man yeah and i'm just curious if there's anything in the film that's new like any details about anton or his life that may not have been previously covered or discussed anywhere else i think there is i think there is i i see myself as uh, you know very knowledgeable about it and i keep track of what's being published and you know stuff like that but there's uh, there's uh, material that's never been seen before the conversations reveal things that i don't think have been revealed before and so yeah yeah but the thing is that it's not you know it's not a merit in itself to contain something that is new because this is not lave's story in a way it's the story of all these people who uh, met him and befriended him and and worked with him so thereby it becomes not one story but rather like a mosaic a mosaic of uh, memories, and that creates a kind of, uh, I hope it creates a more integral and more dynamic picture or, or, or an image or a gestalt of, of LaVey than if I would have merely made a biopic saying he was born then, then he did this, and then he met, you know, and then he died. Uh, I think this will be a much more uh, versatile and dynamic film, and, and there's plenty of great, you know, funny uh, archival material and him playing and some some recordings that have never been been uh, seen or heard before. So it's going to be a treat for anyone who's interested in LaVey, either because they know him already or they've heard of him or whatever. It's going to be a, a nice emotional portrait. I would think so. Yeah, I have all the faith in you as a filmmaker and <laughs> thank the, you. The, the material's in good hands for sure. So. Yeah, You know, I got one more thing I want to talk to you about for the free portion of the chat. And then I just want to touch on a recent blog that you wrote for some Patreon extension mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. So before we go for the free audience, let's tell people about Rewriting the Future. This is a conference that you and Vanessa Sinclair, your partner, are putting on mm -hmm. on May 30th and June 1st in, is it Moran? Murano in, in northern Italy. The subtitle to the conference is 100 Years of Esoteric Modernism and Psychoanalysis. Still some tickets left as far as I know, so if you're looking for a reason to go to the Italian Alps in the next couple of weeks, here it is. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell our listeners what the premise and the purpose of the conference is then. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's uh, kind of a follow-up to... We had a conference in London in 2016, which was called Psychoanalysis, Art, and the Occult, and it was a huge success. And many, you know, there were many people and many great speakers and that the material in itself turned into Fenris Wolf number nine, you know, my more or less uh, recurring journal. So we thought about it. Hey, we, we should really, you know, you know like make a follow up to this. But we didn't want to stick like rigidly to the same concept. But when, you know, Vanessa, she writes a lot about these things and it's very interesting. She's writing, you know, books about it and articles about it. 
this intersection between art, you know, modernism and psychoanalysis and other strains of intellectual thought, intellectual egregores in a way. So we found out, you know, that like that uh, the development of of modernism in a way coincided with the development of of psychoanalysis, and and of course she is a psychoanalyst, so uh, she has her network of uh, analysts, and we both have this sort of the the occult or cultural angle, and we when you, whenever you weave these things together, some pretty interesting co- con- concoctions pop up because the umbrella is pretty big. You know, there are many things that could fit under under this umbrella. But we wanted to have a slight focus on poetry this this time. So we figured out we wanted to find a good location. And then some people in in, um, Munich suggest that we should have it at a a castle that belonged to the, that actually was Ezra, Ezra Pound's castle, or rather Ezra Pound's daughter's castle. So that creates a kind of a, a living history aspect that is fantastic. So that's the setting. We're going to do it at that castle and a different castle. And there will be three days of fantastic panels talking about magic and poetry and art and psychoanalysis with people coming in from these different uh, disciplines. And our experience is that the meetings that occur between these different, sometimes quite rigid, conservative environments is usually very, very fertile, it leads to many, many interesting projects and things like that. So that's basically the premise for for the conference. And yes, there are still a very few uh, tickets left. So if people want to get them, they should just uh, check out the web address that Ryan will provide for you. Yeah, I will link that in the show notes for sure. And yeah, I was going to say yeah. too that that the the speakers and the presentations are. I mean, it looks like a loaded lineup for sure. And I was just curious yeah. if you if you know off the top of your head if you could tell people a bit about you know what sorts of topics they can expect to hear and maybe what sorts of voices they'll hear as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a large bouquet, but but it's uh, you know, there's some stuff on on uh, academic aspects of modernism, and, but there's also stuff about actively using poetry as magic and vice versa. And there's stuff about Ezra Pound's esoteric interests, and there's uh, stuff about you know more more clinical aspects of psychoanalysis. And there's Blanche Barton is actually presenting on the modern roots of Satanism. That is Lavey's partner. And there's Tom, an old friend of mine, who uh, ran uh, Temple of Psychic Youth in North America. He's talking about those experiences. And my own talk will be about Ezra Pound's relationship to his publisher. Because, you know, I'm a publisher and I'm very interested in publishing history. And uh, James Laughlin, who created the, the publishing company New Directions, was seminal not only for you know Ezra Pound, but for a great number of American um, authors and poets. So there's a lot of magic in that kind of relationship too. So it's a, a heady mix of of uh, magic and and intellectual strains, I would say. Yeah, it looks like it'll be a hell of a two day show for sure. So yeah, it's three days even. <laughs> oh, it's three. Okay, I just had May thirtieth and June first on there. Yeah, but May has thirty one days. Oh shit! Don't it does. Guess. Okay. Oh shit! <laughs> You're right. You are right. Yeah. So it's be hell of a three day show for sure. Yep. Then. All right. Yep. So Carl, before we go, then tell people where they can keep up with your work. Tell people where they can find your documentaries and your blog, and I guess anything else that you would love for them to interact with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would love to have, for instance, one website where everything was, and I, I do have one that's like tries to do that, and that's very simple: carlabramson.com. But at the same time, I'm you know the publishing company. That's one venture that's uh, you know has its own mail order, and that's trapar.net, t r a p a r t dot net. That's about the books, you know. And then there's traparfilm.com, which is sort of that's the film production company that I have. And then of course there's the Patreon that I share with uh, Vanessa for all of our stuff that we're doing together, and we're doing a lot of stuff. So that's usually where I try to get people to go. Uh, because it's more of an intimate uh, community of actual, you know, dialogues and actual messages going back and forth. Uh, and that's um, patreon.com slash Vanessa 23 Carl, Vanessa 23 Carl. And there, there's some other places. Yeah, of course, Vimeo on Demand. I don't have the address in my head, but if you go to Vimeo on Demand and look for Carl Abrahamson, uh, you will find all of uh, my uh, existing films are available there. And then, uh, yeah, then there's the music. <laughs> there's the music. We also have a label called Highbrow Low Life, which releases all of the music that we make. 
So that's at highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com. And there's also highbrow-lowlife.com, et cetera, et cetera. I think the best thing is maybe to find one of these and they will be interlinked, all of these sites. Yeah, there's plenty of places where you can find me. And then from there, you can go to, to all of these places. They're interlinked. I'll try to link to all of them in the show notes. Great. So that, that will be... Uh, Beautiful. Yeah. People will be able to find you wherever they would like to interact with you for sure. So mm-hmm. Carl Abrahamson, dude, thanks so much for the time. Again, really appreciate it. Hope to talk to you again soon. Very nice, Ryan. And I hope the same. Let's just stay in touch and keep the conversation going. And most importantly, keep the rants going. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I, I'm always good for a good rant, for sure. Good. Okay. So rant soon then. And there you have it. My thanks again to Carl Abrahamson. All those links are in the show notes if you're interested in checking out that Kenneth Anger documentary or any other aspect of Carl's work. Well worth a few minutes of your time, believe me. You know, I remember the first time I saw a Kenneth Anger film. I was in college. It was uh, Scorpio Rising. I was interested in majoring in film and probably should have in hindsight, but that's neither here nor there. I took a couple film courses as electives, and one of my friends in those classes suggested a few directors to me. Uh, Roger Corman was one of them. Kenneth Anger was another. Scorpio Rising was the first film I chose to watch of his because I liked the title. I'm a Scorpio, so it just made sense. And I don't really remember all of the film, and I haven't rewatched it since, but what I do remember is being sort of dazed throughout it, and I'm pretty sure I was sober. But I just remember like a barrage of, of these erotic and maybe even grotesque images on the screen, and also I guess what I would call now occult symbols, even though at the time I wasn't tuned into that stuff. But it goes to show the power of image and symbol, and how those things can remain embedded into your subconscious long after you experience them. This is why advertising exists. This is why pornography is free. This is why art is the highest form of magic, in my opinion, because it seeps into those crevices, into those fractures that we all have, and it roots and it stays and it wields power over your experience, whether you realize it or not, what's seen cannot be unseen, right? And while that can be detrimental, it can also be empowering if approached in the right way. And that's why I wanted to chat with Carl about this, because he has empowered himself through these experiences. Anger's films have impacted his life in a positive way. They've helped inspire him to create his own art and share that with whoever stumbles across it and hopefully inspires someone to create their own. But none of that commercial nonsense. We need soul-rattling stories and consciousness-enhancing experiences. And you know, after the chat, Carl and Vanessa pledged some support to the Patreon campaign here. So my thanks to them for doing that. A few more of you also pledged some support recently. And my thanks to Kelly, Jesus, and Derek. If you want to join these fine folks in helping grow this show, patreon.com slash oldculture is the best place to do that. I am trying to get back into the swing of weekly shows instead of bi-weekly, but life is tough, man. And energy is precious. I've been trying to supplement with some raw episodes for $5 plus patrons, which require no post-production on my end, as opposed to the hours of post-production I put into each full-length episode here. I do all this myself. I don't have an editor or a team working with me here. You don't hear a lot of ums and uhs and breath noises or lip smacking. I cut all or most of those noises out for a more enjoyable listening experience, and that takes some time, especially with all the normal day-to-day human responsibilities. So bear with me. You know, keep listening, support the show if you can, whether that's monetarily month-to-month through Patreon or one-time donations through PayPal or even reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. It all helps, believe me. Also, we'll hopefully have some new merch coming soon with that new logo on it. Hopefully you guys have seen that new logo by now. And some other designs, too, in the works, uh, at least in my head. I guess I just need to get them on paper and into the computer. Culturepodcast.com slash merch is the place for what's available right now. And patrons get a nice discount, either 15 or 25% at the store, depending on your level of support. So take advantage of that. Just contact me for the discount code. Anyway, that's enough house cleaning and gratuitous marketing. I'm out of here. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
please rewind this cassette.